Have you ever thought about the effect that other people have on us? I'm guessing it's similar for you as it is for me. Some people tend to bring out the best in us and others the worst. So my family complain that when my younger brother and I get together, the conversation very rapid, rapidly slides into a morass of old shared jokes and experiences and cryptic references to our former shared lives that make it impossible for anybody else to know what we're even talking about. There are other people who draw out the cynic in me or the joker, or even in one or two rare cases, there are some people who make me go into my shell. And then there are people whose lives are so compellingly attractive and Christ-like that they manage both to spur me on to live for Jesus and often make me feel deeply uncomfortable, even exposed and a bit hypocritical as I'm forced to face some of my own half-heartedness. I've met a succession of those people over the years. When I really started living for Jesus as a 14-year-old, it was because one of the youth leaders was so transparently Christ-like and passionate about Jesus that they made me realize that, you know, trying to behave in school, hand my homework in, time, in on time and be a generally good boy wasn't really what it meant to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I once spent some time with a guy who'd been a professional poker player until he was 48. He really had lived on the wrong side of the tracks, and he was so marvelously converted out of the blue that he just oozed gratitude. There was a guy that I did youth work years ago, and his godliness was, was so apparent that even though we were good friends and we played football together, he always made me feel slightly like I'm not the real deal. Now, hanging out with the Apostle Paul sometimes makes me feel a bit like that too. The, the danger of the passage we've just read is that it does, for some of us, bring our deepest fears and insecurities bubbling to the surface. 1 Thessalonians 2 has the potential to heighten our long-held, suppressed suspicions that we're about to be found out that we're just pretending, covering up, playing the game. The danger is that First Thessalonians 2 actually directs our eyes firmly to ourselves, for some of us at least. Now, for some of the rest of us, there's absolutely no danger that that's going to happen because <laughs> we don't really think about ourselves at all. <laughs> the, the danger is we just, just drift through this morning without hearing anything that First Thessalonians 2 says. But whether we're prone to introspection or just being oblivious, let's not go down either of those roads. This morning, let's ask for God's help to hear this passage for what it is, which is a, a gentle call to tender authenticity in ministry. As those who are messed up human beings on whom God has lavished his love and in whom God is working relentlessly by his spirit. Now, a bit unexpectedly, in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul gives us a little bit of autobiography. He, he reminds the Thessalonians of what happened in those short, intense weeks he was with them. Now, why does he do it? Well, first he does it because the Thessalonians' fellow citizens are putting the church under huge pressure to distance themselves from Paul the troublemaker who'd been run out of time. Remember, Paul was hated by respectable pagans who were preoccupied with Roman patronage of the city, didn't want anyone to mess that up, and he was hated by Jews because Paul was a traitor and his message was anathema. Now, because the church in Thessalonica is brand spanking new, has been robbed of their planting pastor long before he got to cover all five M's and he's being pressured to cut off ties with him, Paul writes to safeguard his relationship with them and the trustworthiness of the little he did get to teach them. So in chapter 2, he defends his integrity and his motives, and he maps out a succinct template, essentially a model for the, for the Christian life and ministry, a philosophy of ministry, if you like, which I think is just about the most helpful in the New Testament. Now, I should warn you up front, there is very little new or fresh or innovative in what I'm about to say. So, 
you know, when you think that, when you get to the end, it's quite okay. I was there long before you. <laughs> now, I, I, do say, I do occasionally say to our students that um, one of the key lessons they have to learn if, if they're going to teach the Bible for the rest of their lives is that if they're saying something new, they are almost certainly wrong. <laughs> I mean, you don't need me to tell you, we're not actually called to innovate. We're called to state and restate lots of things that are really quite blindingly obvious from God's clear word. So in the interest of trying to practice what I preach, I hope pretty much everything I say this morning is blindingly obvious. I, I do have some form in this department. Years ago when we were in Dublin, we're going through some church conflict and a disgruntled elder came to me and said, Gary, I really don't like your preaching. All your sermons are exactly the same. <laughs> and in a rare moment of wisdom, I said, thank you very much. <laughs> I, and they looked at me slightly thrown. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, well, I've just preached through, I think it was the back end of Genesis, you know, Ephesians and First Peter. And I said, I have poured myself into making these feel different, sound different, be set up differently, but you're actually on to me. I, I really only have one thing to say. <laughs> and, and if you don't like it, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. <laughs> and I think that that is the essence of gospel ministry. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to wow you with great insights that you've never seen in First Thessalonians 2, but I am going to invite you to sit back again and to hear the word of God to us as people whose lives are dominated by serving the Lord Jesus, as he equips us and reassures us as his children and servants. Now, we'll just, we're going to stop at verse 16, but there are three basic movements in the passage. First, Paul talks about his inner motives uh, up to the middle of verse 7. Then he talks about his methods, what he actually did. And then finally, he finishes, as he will do again and again throughout this letter, by talking about his expectations. But, but as the apostle does this, I think Paul calls us to do three things. And the first, we, we touched on it last night. We are actually called to live before an audience of one. For you ourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, probably is better, was not insincere. Paul's not just saying that his visit to Thessalonica hadn't been a complete waste of time. He's reminding them that his arrival in Thessalonica, his coming, wasn't accompanied by trumpets and drums or a massive pre-publicity campaign. He just showed up and preached the gospel. Now, in the first century, the coming of an ancient orator to town could be quite an event. Dio Chrysostom, for example, modestly describes his arrival on the next stop on his empire speaking tour like this. I was escorted with much enthusiasm and honor, the recipients being grateful for my presence and begging me to address them and advise them and flocking about my doors from early dawn. Typical Sunday experience in an FIC church, I know. <laughs> No such showmanship for Paul. He came, he preached, he lived the gospel. And remember, the run-up to his arrival had been a bit different. I mean, Acts 17 tells us he wasn't so much escorted into the city as chased into the city. He'd been run out of Philippi. His journey to them even had been marked by suffering. Verse 2, although we'd already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. This isn't carefully choreographed or designed to impress. His arrival doesn't smack of empty show. Instead, he comes with a stench of suffering on his clothes but he had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. Now, that little phrase, in our God, there's a bit tricky, but it's important. Greg Beale, in a brilliant short commentary he's written on Thessalonians, argues that in our God should be translated before our God. Now, if he's right, and I think he is, Paul is actually talking about living before God as our only audience. When I arrived... The only thing on my mind was pleasing 
God. But even if that's not what he has in mind in verse 2, it's certainly what he's talking about in verses 3 to 4. Our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Paul's ministry is neither morally nor intellectually flawed. It doesn't flow from dodgy motives. It's not designed to reel in suckers. His ministry's got integrity. It's straightforward. And astonishingly, Paul says that his ministry has been approved by God. His ministry bears the glorious stamp of God's approval. Paul says his ministry has been tested and found genuine by God himself. What does that mean? I'm sure we'd all like to be able to say that of our ministries. But can it be? Is this for the apostle and his mates? Just for them? I reckon for some of us, you know, we've kind of crawled here this week, dogged by uncertainty, discouragement. For some of us, even doubt whether we're in the right place doing the right thing. We do want to know if our ministry is tested and approved by God. And then also there may be some of the rest of us, and it seldom occurs to us to ask if our ministry is tested and approved by God. Like, of course it is. Why wouldn't he? Either way, it's actually important for us to stop for a second and think about what this means. The idea of being tested by God is not actually a new one. It's surprisingly prominent in the Old Testament. Both David and Jeremiah underline both their need and dread of being searched and tried and tested by God. Psalm 17, verse 3, David said, You've tried my heart. You've visited me by night. You've tested me. You'll find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth won't transgress. Psalm 26, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I've walked in my integrity. I've trusted in Yahweh without wavering. Prove me, O Yahweh. Try me. Test my heart and mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. And then most famously, Psalm 139. Yahweh, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar and so on. Interestingly, Jeremiah, at, at what is really the turning point of the Old Testament, and I think the most intense period of ministry that, that anyone in the Old Testament is ever asked to carry out, Jeremiah says this, Jeremiah eleven twenty. But, O Yahweh of hosts who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I've committed my cause. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart towards you. And then God himself says this in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? But we often stop there. But re read on, verse 10. I, Yahweh, search the heart and test the mind to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. The God of the Old Testament is the God who searches hearts. And of course, if you're God's anointed king or the prophet who's speaking at the fulcrum of the Old Testament as we pivot towards the new covenant, or if you're the apostle to the Gentiles, that really matters. We want people of integrity in these positions. Paul knows this and Paul lives with this awareness. Now, it's not, of course, that Paul's laboring under the illusion of his own sinlessness. Paul knows and exposes repeatedly that his motives and ours are never entirely pure. Our actions are never completely selfless. And yet there's another sense in which God looks at us and our lives and our ministry and pronounces either his yes or his no on what we're doing almost in a pass-fail way. And Paul insists that God has searched him, examined him, and he's passed. His ministry bears the mark of God's approval. And it's important for us to realize that even in a less dramatic sense, this is still true for those who are involved in leadership in God's dramatic gospel project that we call the church. It's not just prophets, priests, and kings 
and apostles who get tested. See, this is exactly the same language that Paul uses when he tells Timothy to present himself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. God tests us and either approves or disapproves of what we're doing. Now, this isn't a demand to plunge into an endless cycle of navel-gazing, but it is a warning to regularly ask ourselves if we do what we do for him, because he is the only one that matters. He alone knows our hearts. We need to live before an audience of one. Now, to either suddenly become terribly introspective or to ignore this are equal and opposite errors. A while ago, I bought a new set of bathroom scales. I bought them partly because, you know, I'm getting to that stage, sadly, where my metabolism is slowing down and I need to pay some attention to my, to my weight. But to be honest, I bought them partly because they're wireless and they link to my phone, which is just really cool. <laughs> now, 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 there are two mistakes I can make with my bathroom scales. One is to become preoccupied with them, which is kind of where I started. You know, like every time I went near the bathroom, I thought, oh, I better just check to, to, to see if my weight has fluctuated in the last 17 minutes. You know? <laughs> that, that's not altogether sensible or healthy. The other mistake is just to forget that they exist, remain completely oblivious to any weight gain, change in my BMI, heart rate, or muscle density. They are really cool. In fact, they, the scales actually give the weather forecast <laughs> as well. <laughs> But, but I tell you that because when it comes to testing our hearts, we should neither obsess about it nor ignore it. We search our hearts before God. We search our motives, our habits. We monitor us, our affections as best we can. And then we throw ourselves into ministry. We get on with it. Paul himself writes about this elsewhere with beautiful balance in 1 Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Then he says this, but for me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not therefore acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time before Yahweh comes, who will bring to the light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. See, Paul says, do I check myself? Yes, but I don't even take my own judgment seriously. I do a quick check and then I get on with it and I seek to live to please the one who rescued me living to hear the verdict, well done, good and faithful servant. Now that takes us to the second phrase we need to dwell on a little bit here. We do need to, we do need to live to please God. For Paul, pleasing God is actually a very important category. He talks about it in every single one of his letters. For Paul, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we aim to please our Father, our God, our King. And how do we do that? Well, for Paul, because we're in Christ, we're now able to please God, living in a way which reflects the likeness and pr promotes the glory of his cause and of his son. Now, I'm not sure we give quite so much thought to pleasing God, but we really should. The idea of bringing pleasure to our Father in heaven is a powerful one. It, it dominates many of Jesus' parables. It undergirds much of the theology of the New Testament. And Paul's always saying things like Galatians 1.10. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I reckon that's one of my least favorite sentences in the New Testament. See, we belong to a father who has lavished his love on us in his son, the Lord Jesus, who's taken on humanity so that in his person, people like you and I might be reconciled to God and transformed and equipped to please him. That's what we're to pursue. But how are we to tell if we're bringing any pleasure to the peerless God of the universe? 
Well, what Paul says next helps. He makes it clear that when he visited the Thessalonians, there were a whole pile of things he didn't do. His approach is a bit like 1 Corinthians 13, where he sort of tells us what love is like by telling us what it isn't. Living to please God, he says, means no flattery, no greed, no glory hunting. Verse 5, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now, there is both a punctuation and a translation issue at the start of verse 7. On balance, I think the phrase at the start of verse 7a should be taken with verse 6. So, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or others, but we were like babes among you, full stop, with the new, new argument starting in the second half of verse 7. But overall, his point's pretty clear. The Greco-Roman world's full of traveling orators and philosophers, most of whom were in it for what they could make. One of the most effective ways they discovered pretty quickly in ingratiating yourselves with people is to butter them up. The Roman satirist Lucian thought this was such an issue in the second century that he wrote an entire book to try to expose such people. It was not very subtly called Alexander the Quack Prophet. <laughs> but Paul didn't try to manipulate people or butter them up, nor should we. And I don't think you need me to tell you that that is a real temptation. Many of us are at heart people pleasers. And even for those of us who generally don't care what other people think, there are some individuals whose opinion for some reason matters more to us than we can explain. Which makes it very easy for all of us to be sucked into speaking in a way which the people we're talking to will be comfortable with making decisions that they will like or speaking to people in a particular way when they have something that we want. But unfortunately, Paul isn't just talking about crass, brazen, self-interested self-promotion. I think he's talking about every subtle attempt to play to the crowd, to make people like us, to try to impress, to win respect by pandering to people. Now, we're all more than capable of this. And in my experience, at least, we don't escape it. Last Thursday night, I felt the tug of it. It was our annual partnership dinner. You know, that's you know, code for you know, supporters dinner. You know, people that we are encouraging to give us money. I was looking around the room, and I, I saw one person that I knew from church. I thought, oh, what's he doing here? Because our supporters had to buy their own tickets to be there. And then I realized that the person who was hosting his table from our church had a spare ticket. I thought, oh, they've asked Jed to fill up a seat. And mentally, I went, I don't need to talk to Jed tonight because <laughs> I don't think he's got much money. <laughs> That's horrible. That my purpose was being shaped by what I wanted to get, crassly, for the work of the kingdom from the people in front of me. And so at the start of the night, I was predisposed to treat everyone else better than Jed, a guy who three nights before I'd happily sat beside at the church prayer gathering. And we'd spent the evening encouraging each other. This is very subtle and we have to be careful. But if we're living before an audience of one, we're not going to operate like that. And we'll also guard against greed. Calvin once wrote, human cunning has so many labyrinthine recesses that greed and ambition are often concealed in it. How I wish I could argue with him, but I can't. We're always just a moment away from greed flaring up in our hearts. You know, that's why advertisers make so much money. It doesn't, all it takes for me is an Apple event for me to be made discontent and for greed to be stirred up in my heart. But actually, the first time I came to Australia, this was kind of graphically impressed on me. 
I can't remember how or why, but, but someone paid for me to fly business class to Australia. Never flown business class. I was like a kid in a sweet shop, you know, sitting in the seat, pressing the button, you know, putting the seat up and down. And, you know, like, oh, yes, please, Olive's on with that. And one of those, it was brilliant. You know, you know then, then I, so then I got to Australia, by which stage I was a veteran of business class travel. <laughs> And, and on the way there, I'd, I'd flown in an old jumbo jet, you know, 747, and it was, there's a little business class section upstairs. I mean, it really was beautiful. <laughs> then, you know, I spent my month in Sydney, back to the airport, business class lounge. I was all a bit blasé, because you know, obviously I was a veteran of this by now. <laughs> and then I got on the plane, and, and instead of them sending me up the stairs to the slightly nicer upstairs bit of business class, they just put me into the kind of regular downstairs bit of business class. And I was sitting in the chair for 10 minutes going, this, this isn't as nice as upstairs. <laughs> that, that's how long it took to, to ruin my heart. <laughs> One business class flight. And I've got to say that since then, I mean, I travel a fair bit. Once or twice, I have got to turn left but it is a spiritual battle for me every time I get on a plane and turn, turn right, especially in the planes that make you walk through, you know, business class and then premium economy and you look into the distance and you see, you know, seat, you know, 73F is kind of down there somewhere. And I'm walking through going, but, but I belong. <laughs> I belong up there. <laughs> Don't underestimate the danger of greed or entitlement because it will strangle our desire to please God. And beware the desire for glory. If you're involved in any kind of word ministry, you'll know this struggle. At heart, we are, we're glory thieves. We want God to be glorified, of course, but we'd really like just a little bit because we'll feel much better after we've done something if we could just have a little bit of approval, adoration, you know, even kind of low-level worship. Let's not get carried away, but just a little bit. We actually like glory. We may not know what to say, but it's much better if someone is a little bit over the top after you've given a talk than if nobody says anything. We feel better. It's only one very small step from that to the people in front of us being the audience whose praise we crave. That needs to be acknowledged and exposed and owned and brought into the light and then killed off. In one of the Valley of Vision prayers, I came across this line. It says this, It is my deceit to preach and to pray and to stir up other spiritual affections in order to beget commendations. Whereas my rule should be daily to consider myself more vile than anyone in my own eyes. Let me learn from Paul. Let me lean on you and look to you as he did. As those who are all involved in gospel ministry, this is our world. It's a world of soul searching and repentance, a world of exhilaration and humiliation, of striving to speak for God's glory and struggling to cope with pride when you're affirmed and self-doubt when nobody says anything and self-pity and despair when we're criticized, which is why Paul's so insistent on the vital importance of living before an audience of one with a child like a babyish focus on pleasing God. Which takes us eventually to the second part of Paul's defense and template for ministry, which he urges on us in 7 to 12. He, he says we need to love like God himself. But just before we move on to that, and don't worry, the second or third bits will be much shorter. Let me flag up one thing. Paul writes these words to give us a philosophy of ministry, a template. But remember, he does this because people were saying terrible things about him. And those who loved him in Thessalonica were starting to believe it. And that's really hard. I don't know about you, but 
I don't really care all that much if strangers, people I've never met, think ill of me. But if people I know and love and care for, if my peers, if my colleagues, if my friends start to make assumptions about how I've lived or decisions I've made that aren't fair, that's really tough. Being slandered, being slandered by people who know you, when your friends start to believe the slander, that's as bad as it gets. Like, remember, this is a real letter written in a real situation, and Paul's not sitting being kind of coldly apostolic at Athens. <laughs> He's dealing with people he loves, starting to believe stuff about him that isn't true. Well, that's really hard. Now, there is a tangential application for that, which is, which is not at the core of the passage, but it is important. I think it would be a great thing to do to resolve, to refuse to believe anything evil about brothers and sisters in Christ unless it's firsthand. And unless we've talked to them about it. Because we are brothers and sisters. We are family. And that is one way of guarding the partnership in the gospel of this fellowship and, and for all of us as brothers and sisters. It's that kind of trust in each other and willingness to deal with hard things when there is real substance that will hold the FIC together and enable it to flourish moving, moving into the future. But back to verse 7. Love like God himself. Uh, what, one of the strange things about being the principal of a theological college is, is actually the fact that we're trying to prepare people for a lifetime of gospel ministry. We're, we're not actually just trying to prepare people to take up a ministry job next year. We're trying to equip people to be wise and godly and strategic in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And one of the things that that means is that it's our job to spend time trying to spot the strengths and weaknesses of our own formative influences, spotting gaps and idiosyncrasies in our evangelical ecosystem right now. It means listening out for what's not being said as well as what is being said. It, it's trying to be aware of our own biases <laughs> Because if there are things that we emphasize now or we leave out now, <laughs> the church will feel the impact of that in another 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And some of you might come and yell at me. So I don't want that to happen. So we try to plug the gaps now. What are we not talking about in our world just now? What are we not saying? I'm sure there are loads of things. But I think for me, there's one thing that really stands out. We're not talking about love. Now, think of the circles you're part of. What, what words would people associate with the FIC? Intentional? Missional? Focused? Energetic? Would they say, oh, they're the love guys? No, you know, let's face it, I'm a prezi. <laughs> when when I, if I say to you, what do you think of when you think of the word Presbyterian? I'll give $10 to anyone who's willing to lie and say, oh, love was the first thing came to mind, you know. <laughs> Exhausting processes, you know, <laughs> stuck in tradition, you know. Bankrupt, you know, whatever. You know. <laughs> we're, we're, in this to, we're in this together. But seriously, you know, the, the, the New Testament is just packed with the language of love. Jesus says, you know, by their love you shall know them. And just now, I'm not really sure we're talking about it. No, I think there are reasons for this. 
I mean, <laughs> if, like me, you kind of grew up in the kind of late 70s, 80s, 90s in church, some of the songs that were doing the rounds were enough to put you off mentioning the word love for the rest of our lives. Theologically speaking, it has been the liberals who banged on about love endlessly. The language of love in recent times has been monopolized by those wanting to affirm all kinds of lifestyles and behaviors that many of us instinctively shy away from. I suspect also that because evangelism is, is so hard and we all struggle with it and it's so urgent to get our people doing evangelism that we don't want to say, I certainly don't want to say anything that might let people off the hook by presenting loving people as an alternative or even as a precursor for evangelism. I want them to get the gospel out. But the danger in, in our moment is that we're not actually talking about love. And one of the things I've realized, that it's very easy for someone like me, who grew up in an age when, yeah, people were talking much more about love, that I just assume that. But if I don't say it, then the next generation won't assume it. <laughs> they just won't even think about it. Now, you could probably give far better analysis than I can, but I, I'm not sure that anyone could really argue that Reformed evangelicals in Australia just now are the love guys, which is why it's so important that we actually take what Paul says in this chapter very seriously. He calls us to love like God himself. That's what God invites us and equips us to do through the gospel, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And here comes my favorite ESVism in the whole Bible. Being affectionately desirous of you. I didn't even know desirous was a word until I read it. I once had a conversation with one of my friends who's involved in the production at ESV, and I was begging with him, you know, to do another kind of run through, you know, and translate the bits that are left into actual English. And, <laughs> and, and, and he said, no, no, we don't need to do that. He says it's grade four English. I said, <laughs> grade four? I said, when was the last time you met a grade four who said, I am affectionately desirous of my parents, you know? <laughs> I didn't get very far, but I did try, you know? <laughs> but, you know, the language is clumsy, but you get the point. Being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you've become very dear to us. We labored night and day that we mightn't be a burden. Verse 11, for you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each of you. Now, I tend to think of Paul as a bit of a man's man. He seems to be pretty robust and disciplined and straight talking. Which means it does come as a bit of a surprise when he compares himself to a breastfeeding mother. But that's what he does. He says that the standout feature of our time in Thessalonica, brief though it was, was love. He draws on Isaiah 49 and 66 and Hosea 11. He uses the same phrase as Ephesians 5 when talking about a husband's care for his wife. He says, we loved you like God himself. And that's what we need to do. See, now, to love people like this, we do need to be able to share ourselves with them, to know them and to know them well. We need to get beyond our comfort zone and our natural friends, beyond people like us. And we need to listen well and ask good questions and care enough to remember and act on the answers. We need to open ourselves up to other people, exposing our flaws to them and putting our resources at their disposal again and again. Loving people is exhausting, but that's the hard road to which we're called. At the heart of ministry is loving like God himself. Now, it's really easy to lose sight of this and to shoot for something easier. To be honest, it's much easier to become a better Bible teacher. I think it's actually much more straightforward to become a, a good leader. Learning to strategize is straightforward compared to this. Loving people like God himself, that will take a miracle. <laughs> but that's what God has performed and what he calls us to. 
Paul says, I was like a nursing mother. I was like a hardworking laborer through the day, worked in the evenings so that he wouldn't put people out so that they'd be able to hear and grasp the gospel. In a very unusual phrase here where he piles up odd words for effect, Paul says, you know how holy, righteous, blameless our conduct was among you. We came and threw ourselves into loving and serving you. We put ourselves out for you at every stage. And this is what it will take to win people over. Signing up for gospel ministry is signing up to love people. It may be signing up to make sure you're the first name on the working bee because you put yourself out for people. To be the first at the prayer meeting because you know praying for the work of the gospel in the lives of others really matters. You may be signing up to be the first, at the first to the building and the last to leave. Not just to put out the chairs, that's only the start. To clean the kitchen, move the tables if you have to. You're signing up for sleepless nights as you watch people you love make dumb decisions and let you down. You're signing up for personal rejection because at times your Christ-focused love for people and willingness to say hard things to people for their good will make them turn on you and resent you even sometimes after they've done exactly what you advised them to do. You're often signing up to be excluded because you make other people uncomfortable because you love Christ and you love them. Why would you put up with all this? Because we know this is the only thing in life that really matters. Verse 11, you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom of kingdom and glory. Calvin said, no man will ever be a good pastor unless he shows himself to be a father to the people entrusted to him. Yeah, we've got to organize church well, but we have to love people. Gospel ministry isn't about being the chief, in, chief executive. It's not about being a oh, kind of stellar preacher who steps onto the stage and then slips away behind the curtain. Though sometimes that feels attractive. <laughs> it's being a father. A father who commands and comforts, who embraces and encourages, <laughs> insists and implores, who frets and guards, repents and weeps. Someone who's strong and gentle and empathetic and authoritative. We're called to love like God himself. Who is worthy of such a task? Not me. I'm guessing not you either. <laughs> but God has already shown us the one who is the good shepherd, and it's in his footsteps that we follow. We serve in his strength, in his wisdom, in his love. This is our calling. This is our approach. This is our hope. So we live before an audience of one seeking in his strength to love like God himself. But in doing all this, in verses 13 to 16, Paul reminds us that really we need to recognize what God is doing. If you want to stay sane in gospel ministry, if you want to cope with disappointments and frustrations and delights and successes, if we want to stop spiraling into self-pity or, or spiraling off into arrogance in the opposite direction, we need to remember that God does all the heavy lifting. He's the one who speaks and brings the church to birth out of nothing. He's the one who builds the kingdom that can't be shaken. He's the one who brings all things together in this universe under one head, Jesus Christ. And when we recognize that, it marvelously takes the pressure off. In verses 13 to 15, Paul finishes this little section by thanking God for the way in which he worked in them as they embraced the message of the gospel. For the way in which God then enabled them to imitate other followers of Jesus and Jesus himself by suffering for the gospel. He circles back. We thank God constantly for this. When you received the word of God, which you heard, of, heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. You suffered the same things from your countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. 
See, Paul picks up where he left off at the end of chapter 1. But now this time his focus isn't actually on the Thessalonians. It's on what God is doing. God's changing people, bringing them to new life in Christ, remaking them. That's what God does. He does it in us and he does it through us. Humbling and correcting and reshaping and energizing and straightening out and recalibrating. And whatever ministry we're part of, it will always be like this. God will always be working through his word all the time. Sometimes it's more obvious than others. Sometimes it's more dramatic than others. But the beautifully dependable truth is that God always works like this. Right now, for many of us, the challenge may be to recognize what God is doing in the ministries in which we're involved. If you can't see it, look harder. Perhaps we need to ask God to make us people who are always on the lookout for what he's doing in the lives of others instantly so that we can thank God for that. To help us to see as God develops kindness and stickability and courage and love for the gospel as the Spirit does his transforming work. Over the years, the people have asked me, you know, like, how are your kids doing? That, that's always a hard question to ask in the moment. You know, I'm tempted to, to, to speak about, you know, our second daughter's bedroom floor, for example. You know. <laughs> but as they get older, I think, I think some of the pressure comes off parenting. You know, you've embraced the fact that we're going to stuff our kids up in all sorts of ways, despite our best efforts. But you also do see that... <laughs> In God's great kindness, somehow they are actually emerging or have emerged as relatively well-adjusted adults who love the Lord Jesus. God does his work. It's like that with church. At any given moment, the flaws tend to be the things that stare you in the face. But God is building his people. Sometimes he seems to work one step forward, two steps back but his work is inexorable. And sometimes we just need to hold on to that. We need to hold on to the fact that God does his work through his word. Yeah, we need to be creative and contextually appropriate. We, sh we need to make sure the gospel is embodied in a full-orbed way, but we need to cling on to the towering fact that God changes people through his word, bringing people like us from death to life, enabling us to keep going and keep growing, displaying his glory through the power of his word. But there is also the flip side. Just look at the very last sentence. So as always to fill up the measure of his sins. Greg Bale suggests that we should trans translate that last verse they finally complete their sins throughout time so that the wrath has finally come upon them. The idea is an Old Testament one that all through history, God's opponents have been piling up their sins, provoking his wrath, taking his patience for granted. But a time comes when God says enough is enough and begins to pour out his final wrath on them, which will reach full flood when Jesus returns. That, that old Scotsman I mentioned last night, James Denny, explains this beautifully. The cup of their iniquity was filling all the time. Every generation did something to raise the level within. The men who told Amos to go and eat his bread at home raised it a little. The men who sought Hosea's life in the sanctuary raised it, raised it further. Those who murdered Zechariah between the temple and the altar further still. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, the cup was full to the brim. When those, when those whom he left behind to be his witnesses and preach repentance and remission of sins to all men beginning in Jerusalem were expelled and put to death... It ran over. God could bear no more. Side by side with the cup of iniquity, the cup of judgment has been filling and they overflow together. So Paul writes, wrath has come upon them at last. See, for Paul, the reality of the wrath of God is never far away. And here it's present. 
As a race, we deserve the wrath of God, and we will face it unless someone intervenes, unless we're joined to Christ, our rescuer and our king. He is the center of history. He is life, and Paul gets this. And it invests everything he does with the most beautifully attractive seriousness. For Paul, it's why living before an audience of one is the only sensible thing to do. It's why loving like God himself is the only appropriate response to the love that's been lavished on us. It's why recognizing what God is doing in, his, in this world, moving people to salvation and judgment through the word, is the only way to make sense of the world and the sobering reality which drives us to devote everything we have and are to honoring and enjoying and obeying the one and only God, Father, Son, and Spirit. See, hearing this gospel in all its full-orbed radiance and seeing the apostle live out the gospel in the footsteps of Jesus invites all of us to live with a tender authenticity that speaks and commends the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King.